Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Hi, everyone. This is your host, Greg Myers. And in today's episode, I continue my series on the unattended retail sector of the payment space with industry leader Cantaloupe. My guest this week is a self-proclaimed recovering consultant with a love for technology and an eye for connectivity. CEO Ravi Venkatesan joined the company in December of 2020 with a path for progress. Ravi and I have an interesting discussion about the self-service economy. Not only is it much more prevalent than we think, but it's also expected to grow to be a $46 billion industry by 2027. According to Ravi, the three dominant drivers for this massive growth include the labor shortage, consumer preference, and the availability of technology. Tune in to hear Ravi talk about the projected growth spurt of an already prolific industry, the convergence of the physical and digital worlds, and what it looks like to guide a company at the intersection of IoT, digital payments, enterprise SaaS, and self-service kiosk innovation. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Ravi. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Hey, Greg. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited about this. Yeah, me too. I look forward to the conversation. So let's go ahead and dive right in. First of all, congratulations on recently being named the CEO of Cantaloupe. Thank you very much. I'm, like I said, really excited about the role and uh, happy to talk to you about this. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background? So I'm, you know, essentially a recovering consultant, as I like to describe it. I spent (laughs) the early uh, seven years of my career with Accenture. It was a great training ground to learn about technology and large scale implementations. I worked with a lot of Fortune 500 customers. Again, I joke about the fact that I got out at the exact right time, you know, before I made partner there, because once you get on that track, it's a little bit harder. I went on to a company called CBeyond in town that was transforming itself from being provider of voice over IP type of services to a cloud provider and went on that journey, started as a direct report of the CIO there and then eventually ran IT at CBeyond as the CIO became COO. Towards the end of my tenure there, it was a public company, we sold it to another company called Birch at a pretty good like 40% over the traded value. So Drove a nice exit there and then joined a company called Bridge2 Solutions in Atlanta again, which was a SaaS provider, a software as a service provider, and more in the employee incentive, consumer incentive space. Helped that company transform to uh, essentially providing the loyalty redemption solutions for all the big banks, airlines, and so on. So became a market leader in that space and sold that to ICE, Intercontinental Exchange, the company that also has ownership of the New York Stock Exchange. So did that in 2020 and then headed up innovation for a merged company. Bridge2 was merged with a company called Bact, which is a crypto futures and options market leader. So headed up innovation for that company and then joined Cantaloupe in December 2020 as their CTO and with an eye to sort of be a succession plan for the CEO. A couple of years later, uh, assumed the CEO role at Cantaloupe. Awesome. Appreciate that. But before we dive too far into the conversation, if you don't mind, tell our audience exactly what Cantaloupe does. Yeah. So the way I like to describe Cantaloupe's business is we're the technology ally for any business that doesn't have boots on the ground. So if you're operating vending machines or laundromats, or uh, grab, scan, and go bistros at an airport, cafeterias, it break rooms, which you don't have a person manning them. Any of these sort of parking, EV charging, all these unattended businesses or businesses that are self-service, our solutions and our technology helps manage them. And we do that in a few different ways. We put card readers which can accept payments in an unattended manner. So you as a consumer can go, and whether it's a parking gate or whether it's a vending machine, you can make a payment yourself. There's no store clerk helping you. That's number one. Number two, which is often behind the scenes, is once the payment is accepted, we make a machine of some kind do something. 
you know, it could be an amusement ride where you make a payment and now the ride is turned on and it'll do a round. Or it could be EV charging where you make a payment and it dispenses charge. Or in a vending machine where it's dispensing or a parking gate where it's opening the gate. So that interaction with the machine is done by an IoT device, an Internet of Things device called a telemeter, and we make those. So we do the card reader, we do the telemeter, and all of our devices are connected through our own IoT network. So it all comes back to a cloud which we operate, and that cloud platform is proprietary, and we also have our own payment gateway. So if you think about accepting payments, dispensing something, so enabling sort of shopping, enabling products and services to be rendered. And when I say services, at the airports, you would have seen massage chairs where you can make a payment and enjoy a nice massage. Our devices power those as well. So anywhere where you can experience goods and services, make a payment yourself, we are present there. And then the other aspect of our business is software as a service that lets a customer of ours operate this kind of business and also manage their business. So in plain English, If I'm operating a cafeteria in 10 corporate break rooms, I need to know how much product inventory I have in my warehouse, how much I have in each location, and when do I send somebody out to restock. So our software actually provides complete visibility into all that and also dynamically schedules for drivers to go out and do that restocking, etc. That's kind of the overall views. There's software service, there's payment acceptance, there is Internet of Things kind of telemetry connectivity. And then last year, we acquired a company called Yoke Payments, which brought to us what I would call self-service kiosk-based innovation. So now you have experiences where we can put a kiosk at an airport or at a hospital or a corporate office break room, where instead of either a vending machine or somebody selling you something, you can go pick up whether it's a stick of gum or a sandwich or a can of soda, and you can scan them at a kiosk and then just head out and sort of help yourself that way. And are you doing this on a global basis or just certain regions of the world? So we currently lead the market in North America and we have a tremendous presence. We have 1.1 million connected endpoints as we like to call it. And so by far the market leaders in this region, we have not yet expanded globally, although we have been on a very thoughtful and methodical journey to do that over the last year and a half. And I would say we are at the midpoint of that initiative because it takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of recruiting good talent and recruiting good partners and then actually customizing our solutions to operate in those markets. Our first priority countries are sort of in the EMEA region, the Europe region, and the Latin American region. So we have a game plan to enter those markets. Okay. And then how big is the company? So in terms of revenues, we reported $205 million of revenue in our fiscal year that ended in June 30th. That'll give you some dimensionality in terms of uh, revenue. In terms of people, we have about, depending on what's going on, anywhere between 200 and 250 employees. Let's start talking about the market a little bit and kind of view it. Let's start at the macro level. You talked about self-service. So can you tell us about the growth of the self-service economy? The term self-service economy is a little bit newer. Historically, our industry and this space used to be called unattended retail. Frankly, I'm not a huge fan of that because unattended makes it sound a little disabled. It is technology enabled is what it is. And the self-service economy, it's interesting. Amex did a study recently where they studied what they call self-service retail, which is kind of synonymous. And they expect it to reach about $46 billion globally by 2027. It's a space that's been growing rapidly, right? And it's driven by shifts to consumer preferences as well as shifts to labor availability and technology availability. So if you think about three vectors that are pushing this whole space, one, consumers, and especially through the pandemic, don't want to interact with somebody else, right, to shop or to buy something. So they prefer self-service approach. The second vector is you got such severe labor shortage, we now have smaller retailers who are talking about deploying our kiosk solution, not as a replacement, but as an add-on. So you have a store where you had, let's say, five store clerks serving it. Now you have two and you have three self-service kiosks that we make. And the two store clerks are also kind of keeping an eye on the self-service so that there isn't theft happening. But those are self-service, right? The labor shortage is another vector driving it. And then the third one is just the availability of the kind of technology that we and other players in the industry are providing, right? Which makes it easy. In the old days, 
well, I, I don't want to say old days because they are still around. The big box department store self-checkout lanes, if you look at those machines, those are big, bulky, you know, they're fifteen, twenty thousand dollar machines. They have weighing scales, they have receipt printing, they have all kinds of things. Well, if you're going to a smaller retail store and, you know, let's say at an airport and you want to pick up a new shirt, you forgot to pack four shirts and you want to just pick one up at the airport, that retailer doesn't need one of those big box. Frankly, they don't even have space to put them in. But they can put one of our yoke kiosks in. So the availability of technology is a third vector that we see driving growth here. Do you think the whole, at least around this part in the Texas area, and I assume it's across the country, Obviously, we all pump our own gas now, right? So that's become self-serve, which has been a long time. But go into the grocery store and you might find one checkout clerk, right? And then the rest of it is self-serve. You have to check yourself out. So do you think some of that is like driving consumer preference because in your everyday spend, you're doing it anyway? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So your consumers are already used to it in certain aspects of their life. Gas stations are a great example. And they're getting more and more used to it in other areas. And look, when you say self-serve economy or self-serve commerce, it actually extends a little bit. All the e-commerce stuff is also self-service, if you think about it. Except that when we think about the physical world and the digital world, we separate it in our minds, right? We, We are very comfortable ordering products online and paying for it online and letting it show up at our doorstep. Because in the e-commerce world, we are very used to it. But when we walk into a store, we are not as used to the self-checkout lane. Some people just go directly there, but many people prefer to just stand and let somebody help them. That preference is shifting. And what's also happening is there is a convergence of the physical and digital world happening, whether you, you want to call it the metaverse or the older term, which is just digital, you know, which is a combination of physical and digital. To give you a concrete example, Let's say you take your family out to Six Flags, you start online, you book your tickets there and you buy them there. You show up on the location and then you collect your tickets at a kiosk there. That's self-service. Then you walk in and you want to buy a can of soda. You go to a vending machine, you make a payment there and you buy a can of soda. You go to a ride and you make a payment and the ride triggers and you do that yourself. So A company like ours is able to make that entire experience seamless. And for the business that's running it, we provide them one place to do the accounting, one place to do the financial reconciliation, all of that. That's sort of where we see the world going, right? A convergence of physical and digital experiences that then are more and more self-service. So, yeah, one of the things we've been talking about a long time in the payment space is contactless payments. So maybe can you talk about the growth of that in your space? Great question. You know, we survey our consumers almost every year and we partner with multiple universities, including the Michigan State University for this. Specifically on contactless payments, what our data shows is that there's a big increase, a jump that happened with the pandemic. You know, it used to be kind of in the 8 to 10% range and now it's almost in the 40 to 50% range. Part of it is, of course, Apple Pay and Google Pay and things like that. But part of it is, People just discovered, you know, during the pandemic that their cards could actually tap. The average person, Greg, didn't really know that. They were like, oh, so I can actually tap using my card. So that's become a common thing to do. And then the other aspect, you know, particularly in things like vending or laundry, where it used to be historically bills and coins, and people, cash just became dirty during the pandemic, right? Nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody wanted to take cash that somebody else has touched. So it ended up being more and more cashless, if you will. So our data basically, as of even June uh, this year, shows now almost 70% of all sales at these types of industries like vending, et cetera, have become cashless. As I said, 48% or so is contactless. Wow, those are some big numbers. So we've talked a lot about sort of the consumer side. Let's talk about the merchant side a little bit. What do you see as some of the keys to success for merchants in this space? So the key for merchants is two things. One, technology adoption. And, uh, you know, to some extent that may sound self-serving because I'm in the business of providing technology that helps people transform their business. But what I'm seeing is even in our own customer population, we have the early adopters, the ones that see if something is working well and then jump on the bandwagon. And then we have the resistors, right? Those who keep saying no and then eventually 
once their competitors have got way ahead of them, say, oh, I've got to have this and then jump on it, right? I'll give you one example. So as inflation started setting in and supply chain issues started setting in, Verizon actually did a survey of all the small businesses. They surveyed about 800 of them that were kind of very representative as a sample. And they were representative even for us. So we were very interested in that study. And they asked them, what are your top two concerns? This is very recent, maybe in the last couple of months. And the top two concerns for businesses were hyperinflation and more specifically, my suppliers changing price, but me not being able to pass that on to my customers, right? Number one. Number two was supply chain issues where I don't have the product that I need to put on that shelf to get revenue and to get profits. The products are just not available and there's supply chain issues. So our solutions actually help them address both of those. We introduced a product called Remote Price Change. We did that in March, April timeframe. Very timely for the hyperinflation scenario where in the vending industry, today if you want to change prices, you have to send technicians out to each machine. It's very cumbersome. It's very expensive. And it was okay because people were not changing prices as frequently. Well, it's not okay anymore. And now prices are going up on them almost every month. And if they're not able to react to it, they're losing it. They're eating all that. So we introduced a product where you could do it from the click of a button sitting in your office, right? You didn't have to send technicians out. We had some customers who jumped on it immediately and got tremendous benefit out of it. And now we are seeing another wave of sort of the, as I call it, the people who say, show me before I use it, they're starting to adopt. And, and I have no doubt that, you know, over the course of the next two years, we'll have most of our customers using it. But that's the, to answer your question, I think it's, it's adopting technology a little bit faster and having that DNA of, if need be, pilot it, try it out, try it out in two places, which is going in is useful. On the supply chain side, it's similar. Our seed software has apps that let people get very efficient in their warehouse and get very efficient with the workflow when their drivers go out to different locations to take inventory and things like that. Some of our customers use those solutions to the fullest extent they can and some have them deployed, but they use only portions of them. And, you know, it's process and change resistance that they are sometimes struggling with. I guess in my mind, I still envision the vending machine and there's a operator of that. And typically maybe they own a few of those. And so it's a very, very small business. Is that still what the market looks like or has a lot of that been like consolidated and now it's larger companies that own very broad scale of businesses? Yeah, so what's happened is it's both. There are small businesses, there are uh, Dad's got his son that's about to graduate high school, wants to teach him how to run a business and be responsible fiscally. And so buys him a vending machine for a thousand bucks, puts it in a car dealership that his brother-in-law operates and, you know, kids up on Saturday mornings, goes to Costco or BJ's and buys product and goes and puts it in that vending machine, right? And presto, you now know here is revenue, here is profits, here are costs. And, you know, you're, you're learning about a business. I know a lot of people like that even friends of mine, right, who are putting their kids through that type of an experience. So that's on the smallest end. That kid might graduate and convert that into a thousand machine food and beverage operation and start doing dining and cafeterias and all kinds of things or go do something else. So there is that. There are medium-sized businesses that are in food and beverage. And then there is also companies that are very diversified. They don't just do vending or they don't just do There's a term now we use called micro markets, which essentially are the hot food cafeteria experiences being replaced by, I've got great gourmet sandwiches, I've got great premium drinks, but they're all on shelves that look nice and I can grab them myself, scan at a kiosk and go. We call them micro markets. So those are starting to replace the hot food cafeterias. And, And we are seeing the people that used to originally put vending machines in corporate break rooms are now doing that a lot more. So it's kind of broader. And they're also getting into the catering business. They're also getting into ghost kitchens. Think of the Uber and the DoorDash world coming into corporate food and beverage side. So you now have ghost kitchens where people are doing really premium gourmet stuff, you know, sushi, whatnot. You're ordering sushi for lunch. Now one of our customers is delivering it and 
it's made by somebody sitting in a ghost kitchen somewhere. A lot of different use cases and examples, that's for sure. Well, we've talked about the consumers and how they're changing. We've talked about how the merchants are adapting and what they're doing. How is Cantaloupe positioned to take advantage of all this? Yeah, so, you know, if you think about our strengths, we sit right on the intersection of what I would call four areas of technology. Number one is the Internet of Things, where everything is connected to a cloud. And what we do is, whether it's that laundromat or even, you know, if you go to a gas station, you'll see these air vac machines, right, where you can fill your tire with air or vacuum. You know, all these things have our e-ports on them. And we call that e-port is our brand. And they all have SIM cards and they all connect through a wireless network to our cloud software. So what that does for us is, We are able to push content there, whether it's advertisements or whether it's other things. So we are able to convert what used to traditionally be a point of sale to a point of engagement, right? So that's one way we take advantage. And that lets us push more and more add-on products to our customers that let them sort of expand their business, but also lets us grow our business, right? That's number one. And we call that the IoT side or Internet of Things side because when you have all these devices that are out there, the 1.1 million and they're connected to our cloud, that's IoT functionality. We can push software to them. We can upgrade them. We can do a lot of things which we couldn't if they were not connected. Number two is the digital payment side. So we are one of few players who can handle small ticket and large ticket payments in an efficient manner. This goes back to kind of the Durban Act and a lot of things that have happened in this country. But under normal circumstances, people selling small ticket items, so something that only costs a dollar or two, they are almost punitively assessed cost of acceptance on the credit card side. Whereas, you know, if you're selling something for $20, then that's not such a big deal. So we have special technology as well as business arrangements to handle those smaller payments or micro payments efficiently. So the digital payment side is the second one. The third one is the software that we deploy that, you know, if you think about the evolution of ERPs or enterprise software, originally it used to be people used to deploy software, you know, on servers at a premises, right? They used to run it themselves. Then you had large software companies like Oracle, Microsoft, Siebel, SAP. They all came in and said, no, 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 no. Here is great enterprise software and we make it and it's good for everybody. And so you don't, everybody doesn't need to do homegrown stuff. So they all moved to that. Then came the cloud and everybody moved to cloud-based software as a service. And now what I would call is the fourth wave of that, which is vertical-specific enterprise software. If I'm running a construction business, I just don't want a generic software that's for everybody. I want a construction-specific ERP system. So our software is specific for the, what we call self-service retail or unattended retail, you know, whatever term you want to put on it. So that's the third area, right? The software as a service part. And the fourth one is this whole kiosk-based experiences and self-service innovation. So if you think about it, we sit on the intersection of IoT, digital payments, self-service, kiosk-based innovation, and software as a service. And that lets us really take advantage of, hey, there's labor shortage. I need to find ways to do more with less people. And consumer preferences are shifting. I need to do more where consumers can help themselves. Right? Kind of a long answer for your crisp question there, but that's how we are positioned to take advantage of this space. Those four things and thinking of them as taking advantage of how the merchants are adapting and how consumers' preferences are changing. I mean, that all all aligns very well. So I appreciate that. What other trends or, I guess, unique applications in this space are you seeing? I mean, you've named a lot of different examples, but where is it all heading and what are the trends? And is there anything unique that you haven't talked about yet that you guys are seeing out there, new business models or new ideas or things like that? So we are. I mean, I think the hybrid of sort of traditional retail and self-service is now about to happen. So there's almost a collision happening of what you would traditionally call a convenience store and what in the unattended or self-service world is being called a micro-market. We think these two are about to collide big time. And the place where we've seen it start is airports. So now when you go to an airport, you'll see in more and more places, the Hudson News stand, for example, has a self-checkout kiosk. And it's the nimble tablet-based kiosk. It's not your 
you know, as I call it, your grandpa's kiosk, which is uh, what's in the big box uh, stores, right? What you'll also see is cars are becoming connected. You know, the connected car phenomenon is coming, particularly with more and more cars being electric. Your car should be a payment device, not just your credit card. And various such things are coming up. So the way self-serve is evolving, I mean, car wash is another great example, right? Most car washes, people have been used to doing self-serve, but they are not used to hey, when I'm driving through, can I also get my tire uh, checked and refilled with air? And can that be self-service and robotic, right? So there's just a combination of artificial intelligence, robotics, the technologies that we provide that I mentioned that are all starting to come together to where I think some of the science fiction type self-service scenarios that we see are going to become real over the next three to five years. You mentioned the uh, self-service putting air in your tires. I have to say, you know, I don't know when this was. It may have been not too long ago, but I remember I had a tire low and I was like, okay, I got to get my quarters together, right? Because it's going to, you know, I'm going to have to put quarters in there. I couldn't find enough quarters. I drove up to it and there it was. It had one of your devices on it and it was just swipe the card and boom, the air comes on. And it was so simple. And I think the days of finding those types of applications are just increasing every day. Absolutely. Well, great. So we've talked a lot about, again, all of the market-facing stuff. Let's go back and talk about the company a little bit more. So there's a lot of new players in payments and fintech, and I'm sure you're running into more and more competition out there. So what makes Cantaloupe different? It's the ability to provide this, what I would call, full stack of hey, we can solve your problem for payments, we can solve your enterprise software workflow problems and let you bring efficiencies into your business. By the way, we can enhance the consumer experience and put kiosks and put interactive devices that can do all that and everything is connected. So that blend, very few companies are able to offer that kind of a full stack solution, if you will. There are companies that we compete with that do kiosks. There are companies that we compete with that might do point of sale, an unintended point of sale. And there are companies that we compete with that might do digital payments and might do it for small and big ticket items. But not one that has all of these elements, in particular, the enterprise SaaS software. Our seed platform, as we call it, is market leading and we are able to charge premium prices for it compared to the competition because it is so full featured and has so many different things. Okay. And where do you see Cantaloupe going in the next three to five years? So there are two areas or two uh, vectors of growth for us. One is, as I said, we have chosen very intentionally to master our craft in one market, which is North America, and to be really good at what we do and then expand it into other locales and other regions. But From a growth perspective, over the next three to five years, we see a lot of growth happening in Europe, a lot of growth happening in Latin America, and then subsequently in the APAC region. So international expansion is a definite focus and a definite vector for growth. The second one is in terms of verticals that are relatively newer, but are well positioned now to take advantage of our solutions. I'm very excited, for example, with EV charging. There are only a million EV charging stations in North America, and they've they've come up very rapidly. But if you compare it with Europe, we are actually behind. Europe has twice that. If you look at what the Biden administration is doing and just overall where the auto industry is going, the demand for EV charging stations is going to skyrocket. And states are now starting to mandate that those charging stations cannot just have an app-based payment approach they need to have card readers on there for inclusivity reasons. And we are extremely well positioned to take advantage of that trend, right? So EV charging is a growth area, I would call amusement, all kinds of games, gaming, which we are already present in as a growth area. And by the way, we are present in both of these and see a lot of opportunities. There are also other IoT use cases. To give you an example, waste management is an area that we've been very focused on for reasons of being kind of environmentally and socially responsible, but also we see a big opportunity there. Our software right now lets you dynamically schedule when somebody needs to go out and restock cafeterias, right? The same software has a way it can be tuned where it's detecting, for example, at an ATM machine, when is it out of cash and you need to go put cash in the machine. And it can also detect, for example, your trash can 
And when is it about to get full and somebody needs to go empty it? There's all kinds of clever use cases on the IoT side that our R&D team is very focused on. And we see that growing fairly materially over the next three to five years. A lot of uh, exciting opportunities. Well, Ravi, we've covered a lot of ground about you and about the company and about the industry itself. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? No, I think we covered uh, a lot of ground. Uh, One thing I'd leave you with is when you look at companies like Cantaloupe and compare them, I think the question to ask is, where are things going in terms of consumer preference and in terms of business imperatives, right? What's consumer preference going to be over the next two to three years? What are businesses going to have as their largest problem? And how are we positioned to solve those? And I feel very good sitting where we are and coming into this role at this company at this stage. So Great. Well, Ravi, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here today. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 